Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of this Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. One of the most dangerous times for officers is during cell extractions. Pepperball allows officers to respond with the lowest level of force and still be effective and ready if the situation escalates. The responding officer controls where the projectiles are aimed, how many projectiles are launched, and how rapidly they're deployed. This allows the response to be tailored to the moment. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in the show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. Well, hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Mike Cantrell once again, and today I've got a a guest, William Young, who has his own podcast on YouTube. Uh, He's been around for quite a few years, and I've been watching his, his podcast long before I started mine. And, um, uh, I really love the motivation that he brings to his YouTube podcast. If you haven't watched it before swing over there, um, it, it's, uh, I'm going to say it's a little different because you're just so motivational. You're so excited <laughs> and I love it. So welcome to my podcast, right. William. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on, buddy. I, uh, I appreciate it. I love what you're doing. I love the information you're putting out. There's just, compared to a few years ago, there's so much coming out now and so many people speaking out about the profession and, 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 and what you need to be successful in it. So I appreciate you being one of the voices in that movement, man. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm proud to be here. So, um, I always like to start the same way. I like to hear about, you know, when you were young, where'd you start off at? Where'd you grow up at? So we can kind of get an idea where William Young is. Do you like William or Bill? I didn't ask you. You know, it doesn't matter. You can call me Bill if you want. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I thought William Young looked better on the cover of a book. That's why I chose. I'm 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 William, but I I grew up Bill. Um and and when I was messing around with the book cover, I said that no, that doesn't uh does not look good. So I and now everybody calls me William or Will. Uh so yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, I mine is Michael on my book. I I nobody at work ever called me Michael. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, unless you're in trouble. Right, right. So, um, yeah, where did you, you grow up at? Like when I was a kid, personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I grew up in uh, in Iowa, and uh, just a little town uh, on the western side of Iowa, and uh, really kind of an unremarkable childhood, I guess. It was just like uh, you know, mom, dad, brothers, and uh, and did the normal stuff kids do. It wasn't, it you know, I don't have any uh, sob stories or you know anything. We took family vacations and and I played basketball, and you know, it was kind of kind of fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm always interested in the reason I always start there is because, so did you have somebody in your family in law enforcement, in corrections? Did you see this growing up? You know, I, I, so I did, and but it really, it didn't play it. I didn't understand it until later in life, right? Until after I had already become a correctional officer. So I had an uncle and he was super weird and his wife was super weird and they never went anywhere with the kids and they were always together. And I remember him messing with me at like, you know, Thanksgiving and, and, and Christmas and saying, Hey, Hey, Hey Bill, what's today? And I'd be like, well, it's Monday and say, no, actually today's Thursday. And when I go in, it's going to be Friday or something. And I'm like, just like mind blown. Like, what are you talking about? It's your Thursday, you know? And so he would, he would mess with me a little bit like that. And I just remember conversations with my dad and mom and, uh, you know, kind of other relatives, them kind of being the outcasts of the family and them just kind of always being like, people didn't understand why they behaved the way they did. And so growing up, he was just a weird uncle. Right. right. And I, I knew he was a jailer. But I didn't know what that meant. And right. and so it wasn't until I uh, 
I started looking into corrections and, and really I got into it like a lot of people do, uh, you know, trying to become a police officer. I worked, I worked for a, a mortuary transport company. So I picked up bodies, uh, yep. for a living, went to a lot of corner calls, uh, a lot of crime scenes, homicides, suicides, all that stuff. And I did pretty good. And so I thought, you know, being a homicide detective would be pretty cool. And I, I went to my uncle and he said, you know, uh, I know how you grew up and I know your parents and you really haven't been exposed to that side of the world. Uh, so why don't you come work at the jail and then see, and if you like it and you can make it a couple of years, then go be a cop. And I didn't realize, so I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. I didn't realize what that man was handing me at that right. time. I didn't realize he was gifting me a a, a career a rewarding and and now it's become something that I never even thought it would be but I I didn't learn to appreciate that until years down the road when I became the weird uncle yeah. who never let his kids go anywhere you know what I mean I do <laughs> <laughs> Where'd right. you go from there? How long did you work at that jail? No I I've worked at the same jail my whole career. Oh I've, you're I've, still there. I've stayed I'm still there. I'm still oh, there. Wow. Uh I've been there 18 years. And, uh, yeah, I fell in love with corrections and, uh, not only that, but later on in my career and as I, you know, started doing this, you know, when the book came out and I started, you know, traveling and talking to the other officers from other facilities, Mm -hmm. I realized how much I loved not only the profession, but my people as well. And, and yeah. I, I, I love going to other facilities. I love talking to other officers. But, you know, when you think about putting on somebody else's uniform or, you know, running to an emergency with somebody else's people, I mean, I just mm-hmm. that that thought. I mean, I just love the men and women that I work with. And, and I just I just can't. It's like the Hotel California, man. I can't I can't yeah. leave. I, I wish I would have. Uh, understood that earlier on. Now I knew that I was building bonds because you build bonds working in a jail or right. a prison that you don't be- build with anybody else. And I, I right. enjoyed those bonds and I knew that I really liked the people I worked with, but I didn't like the job for years, probably a decade. I, I just fought it. I wanted to go into law enforcement. I wanted to be a firefighter. I didn't want to be a correctional officer. So that's interesting hearing from you that you know, right there at the beginning, you kind of knew this is cool because it took me a while to understand that I was good at it and that it was a good profession. Well, so. it took me a little bit. I mean, so, you know, going in, you know, I'm going to be a cop. So I'm picking up whatever skills I could. And, you know, and I even probably gotten some arguments with people early on in my career. And I remember one kid, we were standing in the dressing room and he was like, and I was kind of being shitty with him. I'm like, you know, I'm this, I'm just passing through. And he's like, well, and it kind of offends me that you say that because this is my life and this is my career. I didn't understand what that meant. And right. so it wasn't until a, a few years later, probably, I would say probably three or four years into my career where I'm like, I am good at this. Like I, and, and so I did, I went through the process and I went, you know, I, I took the test and I jumped the fences and I did all that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I got, got far in the process and then I, and then I pulled out because I was established. I mm-hmm. was, I, I, I don't know. There, there was something about my personality and how it jived with the, uh, the environment and, and that I could, I felt like I could operate well inside. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, and I've referred to this before in the show. You ever listen to Jocko Wilnick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jocko podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He mentions on there, he says, uh, he was a warrior from the time he was young. And he says, I don't know what I would have been if it wasn't for the Navy SEALs. And it took me a while, but I was made to be a correctional officer. I had the communication skills. I I had fought every Friday night on the Ava square for years, you know? So, uh, I wasn't afraid of confrontation. I wasn't, uh, you know, I was ready for that. And I kind of wonder if it wasn't just made for me and I fell into it, you know, I was lucky, but it did take me a while to realize that. You know, I, I remember, I remember day two, uh, day two in the Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, day one, I didn't think I was coming back. I'm like, I'm <laughs> nope, I'm, I'm not, this is crazy. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I came back day two, they brought in our self-defense instructor uh-huh. and this dude 
was a beast, still is a beast. And yeah. uh, he came in and he started talking and I was like, holy crap, that's what a correctional officer looks like. And then I'm looking at myself and I'm like, I'm, that dude was born to be a correctional officer. I'm not. <laughs> but you know what? Looking Looking back now at that moment, it was kind of funny because... I was born to be a correctional officer. Like everything, every weird kind of thing, you know, I, I've always been a public speaker. I've always loved to talk in front of crowds. I was, you know, and, and you know, I'd hold court with the kids in the neighborhood and all of that was practice to address a housing unit. All, all, you know, and all of that was it learning to talk and communicate and motivate people that didn't want to listen to you. And now that's what I do for a living. You know, and so looking back and when I talk to people who, you know, hey, I've I've been a waiter, you know, or, or hey, I'm new to this world. How do I know if I'll make it? I'm like, well, I don't know, because I didn't think I would either. And here I am. So, you know, give it a go, man, because there's so many different skill sets that you could bring into this world that, that you just that you just don't know. And like you said, yeah. man, it, you know, the the world was meant for us, you know? Yeah. And you don't know who's going to be good. I mean, we all, right. just like you did, we have this Hollywood picture of what a correctional officer looks like. But you've seen the the little gal that's five foot tall, weighs 100 right. pounds, and she can run a housing unit. And then you've oh. seen, you know, the guy that you think's a nerd right. playing D&D. He's doing a great job. You yeah. never know who it's going to be. Right, right. Yeah. No, I laugh because those, you know, sometimes I, I, yeah, I get emails, Mike, and they say, Hey, I'm, I'm five, three and I'm 150 pounds and this and this. And I said, look, I've seen, I've seen women smaller than you, that the guys don't come out of their room when you're on shift. I mean, right. so, you know, just, you know, you, you'll be fine. Like I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know you, but don't your size, you know, it's, it's all about how you handle yourself. It's about your character and how you communicate. And yeah, you're right, man. When you look at, corrections it's such an eclectic group of of individuals mm -hmm. and 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 the fun thing is is nobody like like we all just kind of stumbled into this world it it, right. it wasn't like we planned this from day one uh so it's kind of fun hearing all those backstories and stuff it is it absolutely is um so and i don't know which episode it was but i was watching one last week and you talk about how corrections changes people and i kind of wondered what was the first change you noticed in yourself? And then can you talk a little bit about that, how it does change us and how we can, you know, guard against that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that's the, that's the number one thing, Mike, is this job, this career changes you no matter what. And, and for me, I found it, it, it started, what I noticed, I guess, was that I was becoming more aggressive with people mm -hmm. outside. I was right. assertive. Let's say assertive, not aggressive. I was being more assertive. And, uh, you know, I started I started uh, handling family arguments like I was clearing combatants in a day room, you know, <laughs> and 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 that doesn't work so well, uh, you know, when you try to talk to your wife and like she's an inmate. And right. uh, so, it, you know, I, I it's kind of started down that road a little bit and. And then the other change uh, that I really noticed was that I was, uh, when I wasn't at work, I was, I was kind of sad, like I was missing something and I didn't know uh, what it was. And so I would pick fights, I would pick arguments. And, yeah. and so my body could kind of crave that, that adrenaline, um, it, it, you know, and so that's, that's the scary thing. The number one thing is that, that I tell people, Mike, is that, Corrections changes everybody, whether it's your schedule, whether it's your family schedule, or whether you became a, become a raving lunatic. You, everybody is going to change, and that looks different for everybody. And 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 the so the kind of the the scary thing about it is that I feel like we're trained to change. Okay, so uh, there's this. If you look at our academies, and you look at how what they teach us that inmates are going to lie to us that they're going to manipulate us that they're going to try to kill us that they're going to always be working an angle you know i i had a kid email me his notes from day one uh from california department of corrections he was so excited he wanted to share them uh the the, the first thing they told him to write down was don't trust anybody ever not inmates or staff yeah. and i'm like Holy smokes. Like, okay, I mean, I get it, right? Inmates do lie to us. Inmates do manipulate us. Inmates do try to kill us. But 
we're not shown how to shut that off, right? And so after five years, 10 years, you know, 15, 20 of working 50, 60, 70 hours a week in that environment, you stop trusting your neighbor. You stop trusting your brother. You stop trusting your spouse. And and you don't know why, because inside you're a rock star. Inside you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. The skills that they teach you keep us alive inside. But outside, they kind of make the world a little more complicated. And so, you know, that's that's the thing is, is we're taught that inmates are the enemy. And uh, I don't think that's the whole truth. I think that the environment itself... The, the culture, the structure, that's the enemy. And we're, we're not told about that. Right. I'm, I'm smiling so big because I asked you that question. When, what was the first time you noticed a change? And you hit it on the head with me because my wife came to me one time at a, uh, a Boy Scout meeting. And she goes, <laughs> well, you quit looking like a correctional officer. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, right. you're standing over here with your back against the wall and your arms crossed like everybody in here is after you. And right. I didn't even realize I was doing it because that's what I did right. all day long, you know? So that was one of the first changes I noticed. Well, I didn't notice it. She did. <laughs> she right, was, right, right. Yeah, that kind of fronted me out on it. So interesting. Well, and I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't change anything. I, it wasn't until my wife, I, I had a blow up at a, we got together with some of her friends, which I didn't want to go because I didn't want to get to know new people. I didn't have a two or three day leeway to get geared up to mentally prepare myself. And uh, I flipped out on this chick and it was because, I mean, she was being crappy and, and in, instead of just letting it go, I flipped out. And my wife, the next day, it was one of them deals where, you know, your wife's pissed. But, you know, she's not going to do this in front of people. Mm -hmm. So I went home, went to bed, woke up, and she said, you're not good with people anymore, and you need mm -hmm. to figure it out. And I'm like, yeah. oh, well, I like being married, and uh, so I should probably figure this out. And so that's kind of what sent me down that path is, is, you know, people in my life, inmates included, were starting to say, hey, dude, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, nothing. What's wrong with you, you know? But yeah. if enough people tell you, there's probably something wrong with you. <laughs> So is this the is this about the time you started thinking about writing the books? This is, is the what? time. Yeah, I mean, this is right around the time where I'm like, holy crap, uh, something's wrong with me, and I don't know what it is, right? And so, uh -huh. um, I started looking into, uh, you know, I looked at my kids, and my kids are fine, and I looked at my relationship, and other than me being a jerk, it was fine, and I'm and I'm trying to think like what is going on? And so I started looking into corrections. You know, I did what everybody does and they go to Google and I'm like, stress, stress in law enforcement, stress in corrections. Oh, burnout corrections. Oh, what's this corrections fatigue thing? Holy crap. Look at this, the suicide rate in corrections. And I started looking at the side effects, the symptoms, kind of some of the things that people have been suffering through. And I'm like, that's me. Like a lot of that fits me. And, uh, so how do I, like, what do I do now? And so I, I went, uh, to a training class, uh, on corrections fatigue, desert waters. And, um, oh, yeah. yep. it was life changing information for me. And, and I cried the whole week. Um, mm. I was like, holy, this is like, people have to hear this. True. And, uh, so I, I went back and, and. Nothing changed, right? And and I'm like, well, what's going on? So I started journaling and writing down things that pissed me off. And uh, and then I'm like, okay, well, tough guy, now what are you going to do? Like, yeah, the lady who cut you off made you mad. And and now what are you going to explode, honk, freak out, or 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 what? Mm -hmm. And so, so I started writing, putting out articles, and, and they got such a good reception that Katarina said, well, let's put them together and, and do a book. And I said, yeah, that's, I mean, I never, I would have never, ever thought about putting a book together, ever. Okay. And, uh, and we did it and it went great. And then I said, and then people said, Hey, great book, do another one. And I'm like, Oh, okay, well let's do another one. You know? So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe the lady at the barbecue that pissed me off is the start of all this. I don't know, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but here we are. All right. So which one was the nothing that never happened? Is is that the first one? The first one was when home becomes a housing unit. Okay, that was the yep. first one. When home becomes a housing and, unit. So yep, give us that, a little, uh, yep. you know, what's that's about. 
because we've all experienced. So it's that. It, it it it. Well, no, it's it flies in the face of what we're told, right? Like leave work at work and home at home, and that's complete BS. And and I I wanted a title that when you saw it as a correctional officer in this profession, that it punched you in the gut. That when yeah. you saw that, you're like, oh yeah, that's that. Let's see what that's about. And it's all personal stories, man. It's all, it's all, hey, um, you know, you said earlier, you know, this is kind of like what my wife said to me. Well, it's because me and you are, are the same. Jailers and correctional officers and guards and detention officers, whatever you want to call yourself, are the yeah. same. And we all have the same stresses, the same struggles, which means our wives have pr- probably said all the same crap to us. Right. And um, and that's how I, I decided to package the message, right? I want to put you in my living room because it's your living room. And then you say, holy crap, this is, this is what happened last night in my living room. Hey, I'm going to give this to my wife. I'm going to give this to my kid. I'm going to give this to my friend and say, Hey, look, this is what's going on in my head. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, I mean, the information, there's some information floating out there, man, but it, it needs to be, it needed to be packaged in a way that, that it made sense because we're a cynical group of people, you know, there's, there's experts and doctors and therapists and, and all kinds of, you know, experts out there, but we don't care. We don't want to hear it. Right. Like if somebody comes to me and says, well, Bill, here's what's going on the frontal cortex and this uh, dopamine, I I don't care about any of that. Like, why am I yelling at my kid for not taking out the trash? You know? And so that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. And I said, you know what, when I talk about this, um, I'm going to put myself out there because other people are going through the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of how that came about. Hmm. You know, um, uh, we don't realize how much it affects our family. And I may not have realized what, until my daughter was going for her master's and she did her dissertation by interviewing about 40 correctional officers. And it had to do with, uh, the, uh, oh, wow. Employee assistance program and how they, you know, got access to that, whether or not that was any good. And one of the things that she came up with out of there was when we think of mental health, we think of mental illness. And so we, we won't reach out because that's mental illness. It's not, it's not mental health. We relate it to mental illness in ourselves where it's weakness. And that was one of the things that just everybody that she interviewed came out with that. And I didn't realize I'd been doing that for years. Interesting. Well, I mean, what, cause, cause yeah, what it, it is. And I'd love to actually read that. Um, we, it, what do we deal with? We deal with people at work that are crazy, right? We deal with the mentally ill at work all the time. And, and, and we are, you know, the stoic sentinels holding the line. We're not, we, we, we don't cry. We don't laugh. We don't this, we don't that we, we are, we have to remain the same no matter what happens. And so, you do have to do that professionally, and then you end up doing that personally. And there's so many officers, even today, that I talk to that are so afraid of what happens next. Like, after I say, okay, yeah, I'm something's going on, then what happens to me? Do I lose my job? Do I this? Do I that? And it's like, no. Just, you know, I, I, how's this working out for you? You know, like, okay, you're fighting, you've isolated everybody you love. And now it's starting to intrude on your work. Uh, you know, how's that working for you? Can we, can we help you out, buddy? You know? Yeah. But some of that's the culture because there are agencies out there. And I worked in one sure. that if I had come forward with personal problems that I know it's supposed to, nobody's mm-hmm. supposed to know, but it always got out, you know? And then next time I'm right. up for a promotion, you know, they're thinking, well, hell, he can't even handle home. How's he going to handle a housing unit? How's he going to handle staff? Right. And so that was always something that went through my right. head. Um, and I think that goes through a lot of other people's head. Um, I don't know how we change that other than to change the culture, to be more inclusive, more em- embrace each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know, man. I, it, no, it does. And, 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 and shame on those guys for doing that stuff, man. It, you know, there are officers out there who are literally killing themselves yes. for a mission statement. 
and 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 your the least that you can do is to provide them some mental health resources. You know, we we do uh you know 40 hours of, you know, crisis intervention training to learn to talk down an inmate and then you give us 8 hours a year uh to to learn how to cope with the things that I see say here and have to do after work. And it's just it's yeah. it's it's ridiculous and it is, man. It's the, it's the it, and so you know I, I give a little talk, and I was just in North Carolina. I gave a little talk, and it's called The Five Reasons Your Wellness Program is Going to Fail. And one of those reasons is us, because even the administrations that are on board, that do say, look, here's here's the resources. Here's the peer support team. Here's the wellness coordinator. Here's your therapy dog. Here's free yoga. Here's all this we're so cynical that we don't want it. We don't like mm. you. We don't, we're not going to take anything from you mm. and, and we're going to just let ourselves drown. And so it is, it is the culture, Mike. And I think the way that, that I'm trying to change that, and I've seen other officers and other departments and agencies try to change that is to finally say, look, I'm at a point in my career where I don't give a shit. Like mm-hmm. I'm, and really in my life too, man, I'm like in my mid forties, I don't care like what anybody thinks of me, you know, I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to say, Hey, look, um, this job is crazy. The things that we do are crazy and, uh, and very important and, and, and very heroic and, but they do take a toll on you and you need to start taking care of yourself and then, you know, you kind of get, you got to get the cool kids that start talking about it, right? Mike, you got the yeah. people that people look up to and, and then it starts, you know, spreading, but mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't care anymore because if we screw this up, if we don't have this conversation, people yeah. die. And that's, yeah. and, and it's not just suicide I'm talking about. It's, it's too much Taco Bell. It's, it's high blood pressure. It's, it's uh, all you have to do is Google what the, the, the stats on correctional officers. It's, it's freaking scary. And, uh, and so you, you have to have this conversation, you know? Yeah. No, I I would, I'm, I'm so frustrated lately. And this is, this is personal here because in the last mm, two months, I've known three staff that have uh, committed suicide, not all of them close, but from a distance, you look at their life and they've got kids, they've got wives, they've got a decent looking life on the outside. What is it that makes you just let this job or, or maybe it's not all this job. I don't know. Uh, but what is it that makes you walk away from that stuff? That's why you go to work. Cause so you can provide for those kids. So you can provide for that wife. So you can have, you know, a little bit of free time. And I, I've been really just, I don't want to say down, but I've just been in awe of why this has happened this way. And I, 20 years ago, it seems like when I saw a correctional officer commit suicide, you kind of knew that they were having trouble. You you knew that they were having trouble in life and it's not as easy to spot these days. And I don't know why. Well, I'll tell you why, because we all look that way. Mike, at the end of our work week, you know, I watched a video one time about how to spot, you know, a coworker in distress. And I'm like, that is how every single officer looks by their Thursday. Like we are all disheveled. Like at the beginning of the week, the uniforms pressed, the boots are shined up. And then by midweek, you're like, I don't, I just want to get through whatever this is. Um, But, uh, you know, you, here's the thing, Mike. And when it comes to people you know, making that decision to take their own life when it comes to, you know, the reasons, um, I believe, I believe that corrections may not be the sole source for their, for what is, is haunting them. Uh, I, for some people it, it may be okay. I, I work, like I said, I work for the coroner's office. I've seen people that stub their toe that, that die by suicide. You know, it's it, it's seemingly perfectly life, but it does none of that matters, man. It's it's the demons that are inside of your head that are haunting you. It's like I I I talked to a young man today, and I have a chapter in one of my books about flat tire. Uh, I got a flat tire one day on the way to work, and it it tanked me. It ruined my my mood, my attitude, everything, because it was it wasn't just a flat tire. It was an example of one more thing that I don't have control over. 
I can't control when I go home, my schedule, I'm working 70 hours a week, and now my freaking tire's flat, and I can't just go to the tire store like a normal person the next day and get my tire fixed. I've got to wait. So I drove on that donut for six months because right. I was right. like, no, I'm forget that tire. I'm not doing that. But you just, you don't know what's going on inside someone's head. And so we all come into life, into corrections with baggage, right? We all have, you know, uh, childhood experiences. We all have, you know, crappy relationships. We all have things that we bring into. And so I, I, I tell people like this, you know, Michael Jackson was always weird, right? And then when he got like super rich, he became really weird. So he was always weird. Just the money and the fame allowed him to do other things, right? So if you are um, insecure, if you are a hothead, if you are whatever, when you come into corrections, it amplifies that. It exploits that. It, 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 you can't come to work inside of you know, cinder block walls and, and razor wire and loud slamming doors to find comfort. That uh, You can't come in and say, hey, man, my kid just won his basketball tournament or sit down in an office and say, man, I can't make the kids tournament again. You know, you 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 have to punch in. You're told that when you hit the gate, you hit the gate and that's what you do. And you focus and you take care of business and you have to be this rock. All the meantime, you're just falling apart inside. And 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 then in some places, the money's good. Or you getting yourself into a into a position where you can't quit. It, 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 it's your health insurance. It's your pension. It's your livelihood. It's what it's all you know. Whatever it is, Mike. Like right now, I tell you, twenty almost twenty years in corrections. I don't think I could go be a cashier anywhere. I don't know that I could go do anything else. And and that's a scary feeling, right? Because my my job could be over tomorrow. I could injure myself. I could get hurt. Like there there's. But it's scary to think about outside things. And so if your family is dependent on your paycheck, right. and now let's say, let's say, Mike, that you, you're scared, that, that, that every day you come to work, you're terrified, that you, and, and, and you can't get out. Mm-hmm. And then you have all these other things that, that, that come into play. I mean, what, what are your options, right? Yeah. I mean, right. you know, and so when you talk about, mental health, you talk about depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, all that stuff. There's no rules, right? It it, it affects everybody differently. And right. so corrections may not be everything, yeah. but it definitely plays a role. Just like your divorce may not be everything, but it plays a role. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I think you uh, had some real insight with that flat tire too, because Maybe part of what we're seeing is everybody's feeling out of control and overwhelmed, and it's got nothing to do with their job right now. It's got to do with a lot of things that are going on in this country or, you know, whatever side. I'm not saying anything about one side or the other, but ever I think everybody feels stressed. We just came through COVID. It's hugely mm-hmm. stressful on everybody, uh, no matter what job you were in. So you may, you may have hit it on the head there. Maybe that's where some of that out of control is coming from, and then they walk into work, and that's just the icing. Yeah. Well, look at look at look at COVID. I mean, you, you you bring that up. All my neighbors joking about them being essential, you know. And they're you know the the gutter the guy who cleans gutters for a living still going to work until their secretary has a cough, right? Mm. And then everybody stays home. The whole world shut down. The whole planet shuts down except jails and prisons. And we still have to come to work. And not only do I have to worry about the the scene enemy that I have to deal with, right? But now I have this invisible enemy. So so I have this this rule, right, that we all have that we're like keep keep the keep the monsters over here and and our family safe over here, but now I'm bringing one of the monsters home. Yeah. Or am I? Or I don't know. I'm I'm taking my boots off in the garage. I'm sleeping in a different thing. I mean, it it, it was it, because at first in the beginning mm-hmm. it was funny because you know, people are like, oh, I can't go to the grocery store. I can't do this. These are all things that I didn't do anyways because I don't like people, right? I would just hang hang at home. I'd order my groceries online. I didn't really do a whole lot anyways. And then it started affecting us on the inside, you know, and now we're wearing masks and now we're doing this. And that, and, and yeah, it, 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 Mike, we are trained to be in control. We are trained. We have this illusion 
that we can control this population of people that don't follow rules, right? Mm-hmm. We can't even control when we go home at the end of the day, right? And 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 honestly, and I tell I tell new people this: if they don't want us to go home, we don't go home. Like if sure. if if two of them, one of them that's bigger than me, decide that I'm I'm leaving out feet first, I'm leaving out feet first. Yeah. But we push that to the back of our head. And 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 then we we put on this facade, right? That mm. that we there we're running things, and then when life comes in and says, uh, "No, you're not running things," mm. then it we don't know what to do because we right. because we were never told how to handle the mental fatigue, the stress that comes with wearing a, a badge. We just right. weren't told that. No, no, and it's just now coming on. I mean, it wasn't even mentioned. When I first started, you know, right. 1991, it was, no, there was no thought to right. that whatsoever. So uh, it, it has changed some and it's growing. So let me ask about your your other book. And I have not read this one, um, The Nothing That Never Happened. Explain the title and <laughs> tell us about that one. So there are a lot of things that happen inside a correctional facility that go unreported. The so for example, um, it's time to lock down. Med pass is coming in. Whatever it is, it's time to lock down. You got to tell a dude who's never getting out of prison to go to his room. Well, he wants his burrito. Well, sorry, dude. Uh, you need to go to your room. Uh, never mind that this guy's twice your size. Never mind that that you've seen this guy destroy other people. Right? You, who is of no consequence to him at all. Have to say, no, dude, go to your room. And 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 then he does, right? You're thinking in your head, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to kick? What am I going to do? You know, defend a reactionary gap and all that. And then he just goes to his room. Mm-hmm. And you're like, <sighs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know, and you have a million of those, right? Yeah. You have You have all of these things that you don't write down. People threatening to kill you. OK, yeah. you know, the, the, the do you remember the first time an inmate threatened to kill you or your family? It was kind of jarring. It's like, yeah. holy crap. Now what do I got to do? I got to move. Do I got a witness protection program? What's going on? And now, you know, after 200 times, you're like, yeah, OK, whatever, dude. Um, yeah. But it but all of those events add up over time. And that that is like I, I, I talked about your baseline baggage, right? Like the stuff that you have going on all the time. And then you put in all of these like low dose, like stressful moments where something bad almost happened to you, but it didn't happen to you. So the way I describe it to people is when you almost get in a car wreck or a car veers into your lane just for a second, you have that (gasps) adrenaline dump for a second and it takes you a while to come back down. Well, we do that how many times a day, right? Like forever. And uh, so much so that we don't even feel it anymore, you know? And, uh, it, those events I think are the, are the silent killers are the ones it's easy to identify. And then one of the examples I give in my book is, you know, if an inmate comes up and he punches you in the jaw, breaks your jaw, right? Just comes up, cold cocks you. Then, you know you have an injury, right? Your jaw's broke. You're going to go get it fixed. You're going to wire it shut. You're going to drink some milkshakes for a while, and you get it. It's done. You know, you may have some therapy and some issues, but you understand the origin of the injury. Mm-hmm. If that inmate threatens you every day and says, one of these days I'm going to break your jaw, and then the next day, and the next day, and some days it gets closer. Maybe he clenches his fist. Maybe he yells a little bit. Eventually, over time, that is going to be in the back of your head on your way to work. Is that is today the day? Or even if it's, I just wish this guy would just hurry up and punch me, man. Because like <laughs> this is, it's changing the way I'm working. I'm thinking about this, and 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 so that level, that's stress too. Just yeah. just waiting for something to always happen is stress. But we don't acknowledge it because nothing's happened. Mm-hmm. Nothing's happened, you, you know, uh, that that we can see that we have to record on our body cameras. But inside your heart, your body, you're reacting to those things, and 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 your heart is pumping. 
your, your, your cortisol's flowing. I mean, and those are the things that get us, that's you know? Great. So it, 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 it's not the, it's not always the big things. And that's what, that's what gets us, man. You know, I, I talked to officer, I talked to an officer, I met him in Washington and he, he, he had a pencil stabbed in his neck. You know, he, he was taking an inmate out and they, you know, so you can look at that picture and you could be like, yeah, uh, if that dude screwed up, I get it. Like somebody stabbed him in the neck with a pencil. Mm-hmm. Well, what about the guy that I talked to who was working on that shift just the day before and said, man, that could have been me. And now I don't even know if I want to come back because yeah, yeah this guy lived, but I don't know if I would have lived. Like he could have not gone home to his family and now for the first time in, I don't know, we all know the dangers of the job, right? Like we, we get it. We, we are told, but there are times in our career where it's undeniable. It's like, holy crap, that I could have not gone home today. And that's, that's one of the nothings, the, 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 the thought, the realization that man, and, and, and that's what took me so long, Mike, is that I didn't have I've had two inmates in, in 20 years come after me, you know, I've broken up a lot of fights and done stuff like that. But, but I don't, I can't point to the moment where I said, Oh yeah, this, this is what broke me. It's, it's accumulation of years and years and years and years of just listening to things and hearing things. I, and honestly, man, I could, I can point to conversations that I've had that I've listened to um, with individuals that I would say those things haunt me to this day. Like mm-hmm. I can't get them out of my head, you know? And so I, I wanted officers to know that like, look, nothing has to happen to you for something to happen to you. Just right. walking, just walk in the yard, walking through a dorm, the level, the, the intensity, the, 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 just the, first of all, Mike, just the balls it takes to walk through a dorm, to walk the yard. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like who are the robots should do our job, right? Like yeah. human beings should not do what we do, but we yeah. do. And, and, and you're, but you're watching your back. You're, even if you've been in the business for a long time, you are still running scenarios in your mind. You're mm-hmm. still, okay, what if, what if it's going on? Oh, is this guy going to do something? Does this guy have a weapon? I mean, it, it, those things all take a toll on your mental, physical, spiritual, emotional health. Yeah. Yeah, I had never really looked at it that way. Uh, you know, I, I talk sometimes about a story. I'd been in a lot of fights by the time I went into corrections, but there's a whole different feeling when you're attacked. That That's not like being mm-hmm. in a fight on the square at the mall. Uh, when somebody comes right. at you and physically wants to hurt you, maybe kill you. And right. I had that happen. I was on the ground for, I don't know, you know, it always seems like 20 minutes, but it was, right. you know, it was 20 seconds and right. fighting with this guy. And finally somebody showed up. Nobody said anything except you okay. Are you bleeding? I wasn't bleeding. I went back to work. Right. You know, if somebody out on the street had just went through that, they'd probably get the rest of the day off. They'd go right. see a counselor. They'd have somebody checking on them. They sent to yep. the hospital. No, nah, they just patted me on the back. Said, "Are you bleeding?" No, right. Okay, go back to work. Yeah, yeah. So that that's interesting that you put it that way. I, I'd never really looked at it um, from the what civilians. If a civilian standing in the mall had to walk up and tell somebody something who was twice their size, you know, right. their their heart would just be going pop pop pop. And, and we do that every day. I, I you know, I. Go ahead. I just remember walking into Missouri State Pen and I was 21 and I was telling 45, 50 year old convicts that had been in prison right. for 30 years what to do. Right. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it is. That's such a crazy concept, man. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it's a, what a testament to your communication skills, to how you handle yourself as a human being to be able to get compliance out of that. Because there is no, mm-hmm. in, in nobody's right mind should anybody ever listen to anybody like that. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. But they did. And so hats off to you, man. Well, <laughs> I always figured it was because there was a couple of old crusty guys standing behind me going, do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But, wow. So you've covered a ton of topics. I love and And you, 
you reach out and pinpoint some of the topics that you don't see anybody else. What, what's one of your favorite topics that you've covered so far? One that's got the most feedback for you on that podcast. Cause your, your podcast is just so full of energy. I can't tell people enough. Go, go look it up. It's going to make <laughs> your day. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I, you know, I, I, so obviously my, my number one passion is getting people to understand the, emotional and psychological damage that can take place. Like, Mm -hmm. and, 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 and even so much so as where do you put your keys? Like carrying your keys on your belt. Well, some people are like, well, I just put them on my right side. Well, why? Well, because I'm left-handed and I want to be able to defend myself if I still need to get my, so see how much thought goes into that. Right. I love, I love exposing kind of those things. Um, But what's happened with my channel is that a lot of the people that watch it and comment are people looking to get into the profession, right? right. And so they'll email me like, I, I got a video coming out here um, next week about feeding feeding trays in SEG, you know, feeding mm-hmm. people in ad SEG. So um, it's a, it, it is, and... Um, you know, so they'll they'll ask these questions, that, and some of them I don't even know how to answer because it's second nature for me, right? And I have to go back and I have to look like why, yeah, why do we do that? But the but what's been good for me and why I love that is because the people want to know. They're so they want to be. There's people that want to be correctional officers now, and they yes. want to know as much as they can know about corrections before they go into it. And so I have people that have been following me for two years, three years that, Mm -hmm. that, Hey, I'm looking to get into it. Hey, I I just took my, uh, my test. Hey, uh, you know, I had the interview and I follow them and they, they check in with me for years. And then they're like, Hey, I made it. I'm in the Academy, you know, and it's so awesome. Uh, and it's just, it, it, it be, so my, my number one love man will always be, you know, the mental health and wellness of my correctional officers. And, Mm -hmm. and I've learned that, but I learned that everything that we do is tied to that and, and being able to help and be that resource for the next generation of, cause I'm about done, man. I'm, I'm uh, this is a young man's game. And uh, w- when I'm done, I want somebody to, to be able to pass the torch to and say, Hey, here you go. You know, you got it. And, and uh, I, I just feel such a, so fulfilled when, when I can pass some of that, because I had some, I had some fantastic officers that I came up under that mm-hmm. were amazing that helped me so much. And the, 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 you know, I just was like, Oh man, I, I, just, I I'll never be like that. I I'll never be able to walk into a housing unit and do these things. And they showed me, um, they showed me how to do it. And, and now I'm showing other people how to do it. And it is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just love, I love correctional officers and I love, right just the job that they do and they should be so proud of what they do. And it's just, that's what, that's what keeps me going, man. I just want them to know at the end of the day that I, that I love them. I appreciate them and that, man, they should, they should, uh, be recognized. So absolutely. Can you, I didn't even answer your question, Mike, but you know, (laughs) but whatever. (laughs) Could, Could you imagine 20 years ago having the opportunities that people have these days in corrections? I mean, the pays in some places has skyrocketed, right. uh, you know, uh, administration is actually starting to care about uh, shifts, you know, and whether or not people are overworked. Right, and, right. And there's some of this stuff going on that was just, you never heard that 20, 30 years ago. I think it's a time, it would you be mentioned great. the people that contact you, it's a time to get into corrections. This is some right. great opportunities. And if you want to shine right. right now, you just got to go do a good job. Just get right. in there and do a good job. You shoot to the top. So, yeah, it's a great and, time. And, and find your niche. You know, you can. There, there's so many. I don't want to sound like a military recruiter, but there's so many things that you can do when you get into corrections. There's so many different mm-hmm. jobs. You know, uh, in, in, internal affairs. There's dog handlers. There's you know, there's uh, cert teams and negotiators. And there's all these things, man, that you could do that are that is so super exciting. And, uh, and yeah, and you have it all at your fingertips now, it, it, Mike, if I would have had YouTube when I was in high school, like yeah. every answer to every, everything is on YouTube. And I tell my right. kids that I'm like, why do you guys ever get a test question wrong? Because it's all on the internet. Uh, if I would have had that, man, I'd probably be running some company somewhere or something. 
<laughs> you bring up uh, the teams and stuff, and the, in my opinion, that's one of the best things that you can do for yourself um, is to get on a team right. or get on one of those specialty uh, jobs because it gives you purpose at work. And, you know, it's great being a housing unit CEO. I, I was a CEO for 20 years before I ever started moving up, you know, and it, I enjoyed what I did, but I was always on a team. I was always part of a group yep. somehow, whether it was cert, whether it was whatever. And you're kind of held to a a standard when you become one of those groups and, and right. you have people to support you besides your family. you got somebody there at work to support you when you're part of those right. groups. So I, I think that's something that any of the rookies should, should be pushing towards. Find that, like you said, niche or, you know, find those people that you can hang out with that help you through those bad days. Yeah, I, I, I was told, my uncle told me, he said, apply for everything all the time and uh, never say no. And so right. I did. And, uh, and then, you know, I found my niche. I'm on the uh, crisis negotiation team and uh, I love it. I get called all Perfect the time. Slot for and you. It, absolutely, absolutely. And, but you're right. It is that camaraderie within the facility. And uh, yeah, I love those people, man. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because this is something I saw in an agency not too long ago. Um, so the crisis negotiation team used to, a long time ago, just be, you know, you went to training in case there was ever a hostage situation. But now they're starting mm -hmm. to actually bring them in and let them be part of those cell extractions. You're going in and you're going to, doing the confrontation avoidance before the team comes in. And I thought, wow, that's a great right. idea. It's a great way to practice. Are you guys doing anything like that or? Absolutely. We, you know, look at your use force policy. You have to have verbal direction before you use force, right? Mm -hmm. Officer present, verbal directives, and then so on and so forth. And so we, yeah, we, uh, every time there's a cell extraction, every time there's a, an order to go to court, anytime an inmate's barricaded himself, anything, uh, negotiators called. And, and cool. we, we have combined our team, not combined our teams because it's two different disciplines, but we sit down, uh, me and the, the coordinator sat down with the cert guys and we said, look, we need to be called up together because if it's escalated to the point where uh, even if you send a crisis negotiator to the door and then inmates, you know, you know, all of a sudden now become compliant in our minds, they're past the point of just, okay, just cuff up. Like the cert guys will come in and they'll cuff you up and that's good. You don't have to fight them or anything. But so now we call up our teams together. So the minute I get a phone call, I say, call cert and let me know. I'll stand at the door for 40 minutes, for four minutes, for four hours until the facility decides what they want to do. Um, but we work in concert. We have to. And it has been so beautiful. Um, it takes a while because cert guys don't understand what negotiators do. And negotiators think cert just wants to beat people up. But mm -hmm. working together, training together, and then having... Uh, those handoffs at the door and, and, you know, the, the mutual respect for each other's discipline, you know, like I, you know, I'm not the guy that they're going to call to do a cell extraction anymore. We used to, you know, Hey, go grab six guys and just go do it. Sure. But, but I'm not that guy anymore, but I am the guy that they say, go try to talk to this person and mm -hmm. get them to comply. So I, you know, it's taken some years, right. But now, but now we, we, we have that and we, we operate in concert and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And not only does do the, the other people see that, Oh, cool. Look at the teams, but they see us working together. And, and so it's not a, uh, there's so many agencies, man, that bicker between the two, you know, negotiators or, right. or the, you know, these guys and the cert guys. And, but, but yeah, I, so I would recommend if, if, if anyone's out there listening and they're a CNT or, or a crisis negotiator or cert guy, Get together with the other discipline and start practicing training together, getting called up together because it's it's a beautiful thing. It is, yeah. And, and I I thought it was a great idea when I heard that. So, I mean, I changed my mind over the years because I used to be on E Squad, the DCT Cert Team, whatever, and so I loved our cell extractions. I was number one through the door, wham bam, right? You know, and did right. that up until I became a supervisor, and then when I had to send somebody else through that door. I was like, oh, I, if I can figure out some better way to, to end this so that somebody's not getting hurt, because now I had other people's safety in my hands, 
And that was a whole right. different world for me than my own safety. I didn't care right. about me, you know, throw a helmet right. and go do it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that was the change for me. And that's when I really started believing in uh, confrontation avoidance and, and doing more of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, wonderful. What are you working on now? What's next for you? Need more books? Oh jeez, yeah, I got, I, I, I have a, I have a, I have everything, man. I got, I get too much stuff going on. Um, no, I, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of traveling, and so I'm, I'm working on some courses, and I am working on, um, a, a third book, and um, it'll be kind of my opus as far as mental health goes. It's going to go with okay. the course that I built. And it's going to flesh out some things, and um, and then I'm going to work. I have a fourth book um, that I'm going to start after that, um, and I'm going to kind of go a different direction with my other discipline, with it, which is communication. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, you know, third books in the process, and then uh, and then another book to follow, and then my my traveling and 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 you know speaking and and just keep pumping out YouTube videos, man. That's uh, yeah. just grinding, right? That's that's it. That's it. <laughs> So uh, the courses that you're doing, is that something that people can see somewhere? Is that online? Or are you doing it through? Uh, are you just yeah, so I go agencies? to like, I'll go to agencies. Yep, okay. I'll go to agencies, conferences, and uh, I am working on um, kind of like a backdrop, like a mock deal where I can do the presentations. And so like if somebody wants okay. to check it out and say, hey, what what can you offer um, then I can kind of show them, um, and, uh, and, and do that. But I'm, uh, I'm a live show kind of guy. And so I like yeah, to do the, I, I, I like to do are. it live, you know? <laughs> and so I have a, you know, I have one that I do for administration and I have one that I do for, for, you know, line staff and supervisors and stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, I, I I'm trying to solidify that and, um, and and then you know package it from a from a frontline perspective, uh, you know, kind of speak their language and and kind of grab all these things from the correctional space and and show them how it's applicable and why they need to know about it. You know, yeah. Well, that's great. We need more people like you out there. We, you know, so many times over the years, and I've said this when I worked uh, for the feds, they kept bringing the people from within the agency to talk to the people within the agency, and. Right. We need to reach outside of that. You need to share those ideas across agencies, across departments, across the country. You know, nobody's got it figured out 100%. Uh, so that's great that right. you're getting out there and doing that. Where can people get a hold of you if they want some uh, information on that? Email? Uh, just, yeah, just corrections at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, or I'm on YouTube, just corrections at William Young or just corrections with William Young. Um, you can just search that up and, uh, I have a link to my email in there. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. So just, just okay. Google search, just corrections and you'll find me. <laughs> yeah. I'll put the, I'll put some show note links for, uh, your books and, and your YouTube channel so they can find it there too, if they're listening Perfect. to this. So. Thank you so much for coming Thank on you. here. I hope we can do this again. I think there's more conversations we can have. Uh, I really enjoyed having you on here. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate what you do, brother. And, and keep keep doing it. Uh, people need the information, man. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Be safe. You too. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Till next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.